Hey guys, and welcome to the Working Money Channel. Where do you think Bitcoin is in the market cycle? I saw this uh, today by Mr. Whale at Crypto Whale here on Twitter, and uh, I gotta say, I do not agree one bit. Now, he seems to think we're at the lower high here for the Bitcoin market, and I mean, I guess in a lot of ways, some people might think that. Now, this is Bitcoin on the daily. Um, you guys know we hit that high back in mid-April 2021. Bitcoin came down... Uh, over 50% retraced all the way back down here, almost 56%. Finding support down here, that same support level that we saw back in January. And now it's trucking all the way back up. Are we going to make a lower high? So this is the question, right? Are we going to make a lower high? Are we going to kind of cap out here and go back down? One thing I got to mention is that this structure does not look like any other structure we've seen when it comes to uh, market reversal patterns. If I bring us back all the way to the 2017 bull run, 2017, 2018 bull run, you guys can see these pointed peaks. It almost looks like, well, it is a head and shoulders pattern here for Bitcoin, right? We did see this higher low or rather lower high. And then the Bitcoin market just kind of turned on itself. Um, so to me, what we're seeing today does not look at all like what we've seen in the past. The other thing I want to mention is that this took a relatively short time to make that lower high before we really saw the market kind of collapse on itself. And uh, so that was 21 days. If I bring us to today, what do I see that is different? Well, we made that high back in April, as I mentioned, and it has already been 114 days. Now, some may argue if you bring this all the way back, and we see, go back here, we're kind of in the 24-day range. Uh, if we were to take the top of the Bitcoin market over here, and then we could assume this would be that second lower high before the Bitcoin market just kind of collapsed on itself. The only problem with that is now we are making higher highs once again. So now we're up here, Bitcoin trading trying to get above that $42,000 level. Uh, and today Bitcoin trading at about $40,600. So no, ultimately I do not think we are in the higher low. I do think we are just retesting and there is still one leg up for this Bitcoin rally. Of course, uh, you know, we can look at the Fibonacci's, we can go deeper into this technical analysis. I just wanted to give you guys uh, just kind of a brief observation here if you did have, uh, if you if you did happen to see Mr. Whale's tweet with regards to the Bitcoin market and XRP, not too much to uh, talk about with regards to XRP price as well, just still forming that bullish pennant, uh, you know, still moving, following Bitcoin, following the rest of the crypto market. So uh, we just got to wait and see. We need that big move for Bitcoin before the rest of the market rallies. I wanted to mention this, guys, from Michael at Val5 Links. In an effort to curb runaway inflation, this is what Venezuela is doing. Venezuela's central bank is removing six zeros. <laughs> All right, just removing them all together from its currency and putting a digital boulevard into circulation on October 1st. So that's um, creative, I suppose. Fast facts here, an example of the central bank digital currency, the digital boulevard, was announced by the Venezuelan central bank's Twitter account yesterday. Uh, they've been talking about it for a while. Its rollout and redenomination of the boulevard is the Venezuelan government's effort to protect the use of its currency in the face of widespread use of the U.S. dollar in the country, uh, which was itself introduced by the government to quell inflation in 2017. The runaway inflation has been massive, a massive issue for the South American country, uh, as Bloomberg mentions. Just this past year alone, they saw inflation uh, registered at 2,575%. So that is just in one year. Those are some of the major takeaways uh, with regards to El Salvador, sorry, not El Salvador, Venezuela in particular. Uh, this article also goes on to mention what's going on in Uruguay, which I mentioned in yesterday's video, guys. I'll link that up here if you didn't catch that. They also touch a little bit on El Salvador here, counting down the days until September 1st, the official date Bitcoin becomes legal tender in the country. So in Latin America, a lot of cryptocurrency related issues uh, going on right now. And, uh, you know, in a lot of ways, I, I guess they're looking at this and, and seeing this as an opportunity to maybe fix uh, their economy. There are definitely some deeper cutting issues there that uh, you probably cannot solve just with cryptocurrency. I'm not going to touch on that. This video isn't about the economic state in Latin America. However, I just thought I'd bring that to your attention. I also wanted to bring this up because this also speaks to where our world is going. This is happening in Australia. About 10% of Commonwealth Bank branches will close their doors at lunchtime from mid-September in a response to declining visitor numbers. And uh, that is shifting. So this from Bondcrypt XRP here on Twitter. And so these Commonwealth Bank branches are doing this because of the changing shape of consumer demand. Uh, this is Australia's largest bank and they have announced that 
that 90 regional branches will start closing their doors at 1 p.m., after which the staff will start answering calls or log in to assist the bank's contact centers. So physical branches will no longer be open after 1 p.m. in Australia. CBA's Executive General uh, Manager for the Customer Service Network, Mark Jones, said the change showed how the bank was adapting to meet the needs of consumers uh, while also retaining jobs in regional communities, which is good at least. Uh, we understand that these changes may be an adjustment to some of our customers and the team at their local branch will continue to be available to help them to find the solutions that best suit their needs. The move follows a change made by the NAB at the height of the pandemic in April of 2020, uh, when 70 branches from its 700 strong network were converted into training and back office centers. So uh, they have already seen some changes since uh, the pandemic began. Now they are actually closing down branches starting at, uh, or just, just keeping them open for the morning, closing them after 1 p.m. And so, you know, I've got a question, is this going to be a bigger trend that we see uh, in many other parts of the world, Europe, North America, I mean, we're already starting to see bank hours uh, get slimmer and slimmer. We have been over the years, and now because of the beer flu pandemic, because the world is changing, because we have other options for cross-border payments, for example, that's just one uh, reason why somebody might want to go to a bank. Maybe we will start seeing this in more parts of the world anyway. I uh, wanted to thank Bondcrypt XRP for posting that. I also wanted to mention this, guys. This is from eToro, and uh, for those of you guys interested in Flair's Songbird token, I just wanted to bring this to your attention. I thought this was important. Uh, so when asked about their position on the Songbird token, I don't know if any of you guys use eToro. Currently, this is what they said. Currently, we don't plan on offering SGB on our investment platforms. We're carefully researching our options with regard to this and other new tokens from the Flare network. Any changes will be communicated to users. So uh, ONG here on Twitter just uh, tagged me in this tweet. Uh, wanted to mention this because if you guys are using eToro and you also are interested in uh, acquiring Songbird tokens or SGB, uh, they will not be supporting that. So I uh, got to thank ONG for mentioning that. Going to continue moving on here. Uh, this one from Matthew Liny here on Twitter. This is the first doc I've seen showing Ripple being used for interbank transfers in the Philippines and Asian countries or ASEAN countries, not remittances. Also, look up all the XRP enabled fintechs. So uh, this has to do with the FIGI Financial Inclusion Global Initiative, Security Infrastructure and Trust Working Group, uh, Security Aspects of Distributed Ledger Technologies. And uh, you guys can see down here, under Table 3, Indicative Uses of DLT in Developing Countries, you can see Ripple down here is the implementation partner for, uh, Philippi for the Philippines specifically and Asian countries uh, with regards to interbank transfers. Now, it's interesting because when you look at the disclaimer in here, a lot of different organizations involved in this, like the World Bank Group. Uh, well, I can rattle off this entire list. I found it interesting that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is also mentioned in here. We know that uh, they are tightly connected with the World Economic Forum. Uh, and he also posted this screen grab with uh, another mention of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation down here. The head of the DFSO, uh, Dr. Leon Perlman, is the founder and the head of the Digital Finance Service Observatory. Uh, and then it gives you a little bit of information here. It is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So... What these guys do essentially is uh, explore the policy, regulatory, technical, disruptive, and commercial aspects of DFS, emerging payments, big data, and blockchain technologies. A connection there, Ripple uh, mentioned in this document, wanted to thank Matthew Liny for posting that. And Tranglo, yes, Tranglo, the uh, company that Ripple recently invested, uh, I believe it was 40% in. They were just named in this uh, document here. Uh, this brought to us by Ripple Panda XRP. Going global, Malaysia's homegrown fintechs take on the world. So this is a broader piece, and I will link it in the description of the video for you guys if you're interested in reading it. Uh, but I wanted to just kind of highlight Tranglo down here because they are a Ripple partner. Tranglo is a fintech that specializes in cross-border payments. They provide three solutions, a Tranglo Connect, Tranglo Business, and Tranglo Recharge, which uh, respectively provide remittance payouts, payouts for businesses without money service, business licenses, and international airtime transfers. Recently, U.S. fintech giant Ripple announced that it would be acquiring a 40% stake in Tranglo. With this partnership, Tranglo is ready for the next stage of growth. So uh, also just, uh, you know, with that infusion of cash and uh, to be able to uh, leverage the power of RippleNet. Tranglo is going to, in my opinion, has a better opportunity, has a better chance of blowing the competition out of the water in that region of the world. I mean, it's going to be one of those things. It's going to be a domino effect. Either the competition jumps on board, you know, sees the benefits of uh, leveraging RippleNet, or 
what they do is they try to compete without the usage of RippleNet, or they might try to use a competitor, and, uh, well, I mean, we'll see what happens. If they do nothing, chances are they will likely get obliterated when it comes down to market share. Uh, nevertheless, this acquisition supercharges Tranglo's capabilities to include digital currency as settlement and blockchain technology to speed up and secure transfers further. So these guys know where it's at. They're mentioned in this article with regards to uh, a lot of the fintechs that are changing the face of uh, Malaysia's financial system anyway. Wanted to thank Panda Ripple XRP for posting that. And this from the Cryptic Poet guys, Ripple partner NBK was named Best Bank in Kuwait for 2021. So NBK, National Bank of Kuwait, in recognition of this dominance in the banking services market in Kuwait, thanks to consistent leadership and excellence, the National Bank of Kuwait was named as the Best Bank in Kuwait in 2021 by the preeminent business and financial magazine Euromoney in its award for excellence for 2021. Euromoney awards and excellence are based on several criteria, including financial indicators reflecting asset growth and, pro and profitability, and outperformance of peers in terms of growth and expansion, as well as customer satisfaction with banking products and services, meaning their needs, ability to adapt to changing operation conditions, and capabilities for business development, uh, and introduction of innovative products, services, and advancement payout solutions. So uh, NBK, the National Bank of Kuwait, a Ripple partner, named the best in 2021. Wanted to thank the Cryptic Poet for posting that. Uh, and again, guys, if I'm going over these too fast, I will link these in the description. Of course, I'm not going to read the full article. Uh, just the highlighted points just to kind of show you guys that uh, the ripple net ecosystem not only uh, changing people's perspectives in, uh, you know, the technology world. Wow, look at what Ripple can do. Look at how fast they can do it. But also, uh, with the real world application of these things, we are seeing fundamental changes around the globe when it comes to, uh, you know, financial markets, changing the landscape, uh, democratizing payments for everyone, all these things, positive news. And so I just wanted to bring that to your attention. I guess to that point, and I wasn't going to show this tweet. I did see it today, but, uh, you know, I'm going to bring it up anyway. It was from the XRP Arcade uh Twitter account, and uh, I didn't want to really, I, I didn't think it was necessary to bring it up just because uh, I know it isn't necessarily brand new information, but it was this tweet here with regards to the Ripple ecosystem, and I know some of you guys already know about this, but uh, I thought since I mentioned it, this is another resource that you guys can use just to kind of see uh, how many partnerships Ripple has, and uh, Leonidas categorizes them all here. You can go up here, and there is a search field here that you guys can look up. Uh, certain organizations if you're interested like let's just put up flutter wave and uh, it brings it up down here so just as an example really great resource here if you guys are interested to see who is connected with ripple and the kinds of partnerships they have so uh, again wasn't going to bring this up but i did think you know at the end of it yeah why not gonna keep moving though guys this from xrp crypto wolf and uh, joel katz uh, just did another Ripple Drop episode. So it's linked in here, the Ripple Drop NFTs on the XRP Ledger, diversity and inclusion initiatives, and growth in the APAC region. So this Ripple Drop episode, 17 minutes, so a longer one. David Schwartz talking about the uh, federated side chains and the NFT applications. And though collectibles are the biggest NFT use cases today, David suggests we're just scratching the surface. He envisions a future where NFTs are the foundation of all digital rights management, even one where consumers could move away from services like Kindle or Apple to directly own the rights to purchase books and movies. David believes the XRP Ledger delivers a unique combination of the low cost, high speed and goods payments or rather good payments features uh, needed to streamline NFT creation at scale. In particular, he points to the Ledger's ability to maintain consistent transaction fees, something which is impossible on most other platforms today as a key benefit for both buyers and sellers. So uh, different, uh, a different kind of way to look at the XRP Ledger. And uh, I know I've touched on this in previous videos. David also reveals that federated sidechains, blockchains that operate alongside the blockchains, could be available for the XRP Ledger in the coming months, opening up a host of exciting possibilities, including limitless transaction scalability and expanded DeFi capabilities. So uh, more news there with regards to the federated sidechains. If you guys want to watch this Ripple Drop episode, uh, it is embedded in this article, but I believe you can also find it on uh, Ripple's YouTube page as well. And there's more here, guys. Um, with regards to the crypto clarity, and uh, there's a lot going on right now in the United States, I feel like the news is being dominated by uh, this new bill that is uh, currently currently being contested in government. And uh, this is a hot take from Hester Peirce. Michael at Val5Links brought this to our attention. Crypto mom, true decentralization is the only thing that will save DeFi projects. Apparently, she is concerned that if there is a part that you can regulate, regulators will latch onto that. Anyway, let me read you guys this. 
Hester Peirce is uh, an SEC commissioner, also known as Crypto Mom, and she is now warning us of rampant shadow centralization within decentralized finance, or DeFi. Speaking to outspoken DeFi, or sorry, DeWatch founder Chris Black in an August 4th discussion, the SEC commissioner noted that decentralized organizations and DeFi are new concepts for regulators and that having a peer-to-peer -peer system that doesn't have central intermediaries is very different from what they're normally dealing with. So if you want to be decentralized, you really need to be decentralized. And that is going to then put you in a different category from the perspective of regulators, because that's just not something that we've dealt with before. If regulators can find a centralized part or group of people that they can grab hold of, they will grab hold of them. So I think it's just good to be cautious about how you build things because down the road, it could have regulatory implications. So she's saying that even with decentralized finance, might not be able to function in certain countries um, because of regulatory implications. Black asked for Purse's opinion on the best route for developing decentralized protocols, asking if founders should strive to reach the same level of decentralization as Bitcoin or start to build really cautiously and then running towards regulation to avoid running afoul of the law. The commissioner said that existing regulations have been designed so that any entity or person that is involved in the financial industry is probably going to come under at least one regulatory framework. So again, a very, very uh, carefully regulated industry and so, you know, when these out-of-the-box thinkers are creating uh, DeFi platforms, as just as an example, what Purse is saying is that now they have to be very careful because they might just be regulated out of business. Here's another quote. If you want to make a case uh, that you're something different than the CFI or trade -fi system, then you have to show that you're doing something radically different, which from my perspective requires decentralization. If the trust is really coming from the code, that's really very different than if the trust is coming from one company or group, she added. So uh, just some more insight there on Hester Peirce's opinion with regards to how this industry is being regulated. And, um, you know, she doesn't give her opinion on whether she thinks that's good or bad uh, one way or another. I think Hester Peirce, a very sensible uh, SEC commissioner. I think she's likely the most sensible commissioner we have at the SEC right now. And there's also this that uh, we have to be paying attention to. This from uh, Stuart Alderati. He is in-house counsel at Ripple. Senator Ron Wyden and Senator Loomis and Senator Toomey introduced a much-needed amendment to the infrastructure bill that we've been talking about. That is protocol agnostic. The other is not. As we have been saying for years, the government should not be picking winners and losers in crypto or any technology for that matter. And he uh, retweeted out uh, the tweet from the Blockchain Association Urgent, Senators Warner and Portman are proposing a last-minute amendment competing with the amendments, which would be disastrous for the U.S. crypto ecosystem. So just to give you guys a synopsis here, the crypto community is rallying against this amendment to the U.S. infrastructure plan that maintains strict reporting requirements for developers and validators while exempting miners. So the statement by the White House Deputy Press Secretary Andrew Bates says that the administration believes this provision will strengthen tax compliance in the emerging area of finance to ensure that high income taxpayers are contributing to what they owe under the law. Here's a quote. We are grateful to Chairman Wyden for his leadership in pushing the Senate to address this issue. However, we believe that the alternative amendment put forward by Senators uh, Warner, Portman, and Sinma, or Sinma strikes the right balance and makes an important step forward in promoting tax compliance. The crypto community is pushing back against amendments to the crypto provisions of the White House's infrastructure bill, which seeks to raise $28 billion. So I talked about that in a uh, video I did just this past week. There's been a lot of videos uh, with regards to this cryptocurrency regulatory clarity. I'll link that up here if you guys didn't catch that. Um, and so on August 6th, Senators Mark Warner and Rob Portman proposed a last-minute amendment to the infrastructure bill to exclude proof of mining and sellers of hardware and software wallets from the bill. However, the amendment's wording suggests crypto developers and proof-of-stake validators would still be subject to expanding reporting and taxation that some have described as unworkable. Hours later, Washington Post economics reporter Jeff Steen tweeted that the White House is formally supporting the amendment. So uh, a lot of people speaking out on this. Jesse Hines, this is the real fight we need to be having right now, guys. People need to call their senators. And I did a video yesterday morning. And in my video yesterday, I did also mention this. I hope some of you guys did that. 
Vote will likely happen on Saturday, which is tomorrow. The crypto space needs to band together to stop horrible legislation from being passed. Uh, and he just retweeted out Cynthia Loomis's tweet here. We need all of you guys. Please call your senators. Please tweet. Please email. We are facing major headwinds on the widen Loomis Toomey Amendment, uh, burying financial innovation in red tape and sending devs plus miners on info collection wild goose chases for info they don't know is horrible policy. Uh, and it keeps going on and on. So um, do your part. That's all I can suggest. I hope we can get some uh, reasonable results in the United States. We know the United States a very, very influential part of the world. And, uh, you know, it, it, the rest of the world likely going to be looking to the United States for some sort of guidance, especially those countries that uh, still are maybe kind of scratching their heads about this. I know there are a lot of countries around the world already that are already finding guidance that are already kind of in the mix. I also just wanted to bring this to your attention, guys. Uh, this is an interesting tweet here from Stuart XRP with regards to the uh, Ripple and SEC case specifically. And it sounds as though Mr. Gary Gensler might have some backpedaling to do. Just listen to this. It's important that we're not hasty in terms of figuring out what the right contours are of applying, you know, securities laws and then the, the commodities uh, framework. I, I do think that the SEC has in due course been providing additional clarity. There was recently uh, Mr. Hinman over at the SEC gave a, a well-received speech kind of outlining some of the SEC's thinking as to how they would apply the securities law framework. And some of the things that I think you've heard um, are, are factors around decentralization. You know, are, are there expectations of uh, return based on meaningful work of others. I mean, that, that these are important elements that, of course, are not, you know, I'm not saying that these are the only elements, but these are some of the things that you start to look at. Mr. Gensler. Just going to stop it there, guys. So this was a CFTC uh, representative, and he said, Mr. Hinman over at the SEC, this happened in 2018. Mr. Hinman over at the SEC gave a well-received speech kind of outlining some of the SEC's thinking. And uh, we know what that speech was all about. Now, Mr. Yoho here addresses Gary Gensler. Again, this was in 2018. Listen to what he says. Gensler, in your testimony, you mentioned the recent SEC staff determination that Ether is not a security, although it might have been at its issuance. If the SEC had determined Ether was a security in 2015, what regulatory requirements would Ether be subject to today? And I've got two follow-ups. Um, and it, anybody else that wants to weigh in on yeah. this? If they had determined that way back in 2015, at the time they would have had to give some full and fair disclosure. I think the SEC at that time would have probably said, well, it's probably <clears throat> not three years of financials and things like that because it was a new startup. And this is something the SEC is grappling with even now for uh, current initial coin offerings. What is full and fair disclosure? I think uh, Director Hinman at the SEC said it right. It's about information asymmetry. Give an investor enough information so they can take the risk Government shouldn't, it's not a nanny government. We're not, you know, but the investors can take their risk as long as they get enough information. Boy, sounds very, very similar to what's going on in the XRP case, yet the SEC almost choosing to ignore this little clip here. I hope uh, Ripple's lawyers find this on Twitter. Uh, of course, guys, it's always great to retweet out these tweets. Hopefully, we can get some more exposure on this issue, demonstrating how corrupt the SEC really is. Or maybe they have their heads so far up their butts that they maybe just don't realize the pile of crap they're about to step into. Anyway, that's just my opinion. Tell me down in the comments what you guys think. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Like the video if you like the content I'm providing. I always love hearing your comments. See you in the next one, guys.